Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. My name is Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. This episode has been a long time coming, and it's one of the most important stories that, that we're going to tell ever here on the Big Bass Podcast. In 1955, David Lee Hayes caught a giant smallmouth bass from the Kentucky section of Dale Hollow Lake, easily the most famous and most storied body of water in the history of trophy smallmouth bass fishing. In fact, most of the legitimate 10 pound smallmouths ever recorded came from Dale Hollow. Yeah, and the story of Hayes' world record is not controversial because of where it was caught, although, you know, we've actually had people, you know, tell us that maybe it was, or the method that he used, which are, we're going to go into detail uh, in this episode, but because of factors that were completely outside of, of Hayes' control. And because this story is so complicated and so long, it's going to take us three full episodes of the Big Bass Podcast to cover it properly. The fish was caught almost 70 years ago, and the main story covers more than 50 years. At the end of the three episodes that we're dedicating to this story, we're going to reveal yet another issue that's likely to spark controversy that could be even bigger than the first. It's something that's never been made public, and it just might shake up the smallmouth record book forever. You definitely want to hang around for that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so... Hayes died in, in, in 2020, just two days before his 65th anniversary uh, of his record catch. But thanks to the miracle of video and the efforts of Ken and Nathan way back in 2009, you're going to hear and see him tell the story of that catch in his own words. So let's get started. You know, Terry, I, I like to start our episodes of the Big Bass Podcast kind of with a, a rundown of, we'll call it the cast of characters. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I'd like to let everybody know, I am, I am enjoying some uh, Woodford Reserve uh, in my world record smallmouth bass tumbler, and, uh, and I hope you are as well. Uh, sure. Thanks for sending a, me one of those. A world record smallmouth bass tumbler. <laughs> we mentioned Dale Hollow, you know, and, and, and Dale Hollow Reservoir, or as, uh, which is the official name, or Dale Hollow Lake, as those of us who have enjoyed fishing it uh, call it was completed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, in 1943. And it impounds the Obi River and covers about 27,700 surface acres. That's mostly in Tennessee, but a little bit of it is in Kentucky. And of course, the main purpose uh, of Dale Hollow Dam is to uh, generate electricity for the, the area that surrounds it, which is mostly quite rural. Yep. And, and, and the day, Terry, the day that David Hayes caught his fish was a Saturday. It was July 9th, 1955. And of course, being in the deep south of Tennessee, what do we know about the weather in July? It was hotter than hell. <laughs> Probably pretty damn humid, too. Uh, I can it, just it, about guarantee it. It, it, it. There was no rain. But, I mean, just think of that. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking, we've talked in the past episodes that what is your best time to catch a record fish? And... You know, the, the, the Zimmerly fish was caught in late June. Uh, there have been a couple of other big fish caught in the July time frame. But most of the time, it's between January and March. So this fish is kind of an anomaly when it comes to records, especially it, a world record. It is. You look, at, you look at the two fish that share the largemouth record, one caught in June by George Perry in Georgia, the other caught in July by Manabu Kurita in Japan. Yep. So uh, the... The biggest fish of the primary species of bass, largemouth and smallmouth, all came essentially in the summer, although I guess mm -hmm. Perry's fish came in the late spring, technically. But it was 95 degrees that Saturday in July of 1955 when David Hayes caught this fish. And, and before we get into the Hayes fish, which is the current world record, became the world record after it was caught in 55, let's uh, do a little backtracking and talk about the record that that fish broke. Yeah, so the world record prior to Hayes' fish uh, was a 10-pound, 8-ounce fish caught by Owen Smith uh, on October 8, 1950, and it was caught below uh, Lake Wheeler Dam in Alabama. Uh, and then, of course, let's go into Hayes for him, himself. So, well, but, but before we do that, I want to I remind everybody that if, if uh, we did an episode on the fish that was the record before Smith, and the record yep. before Smith was held by a guy named Walter Hardin. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and he caught. He had a bunch record. of records. <laughs> he had a bunch of records. This guy was all out of Florida. <laughs> this guy was rewriting the record book left and right with thirteen and fourteen pound smallmouth yeah. bass out of Central Florida. And if you haven't checked out that episode of the Big Bass Podcast, Nathan is going to throw a, a link to it somewhere up in this area. You don't want to miss that one. So yep. uh, yeah, so we, we've covered the body of water. We've talked a little bit about the the weather that day that Hayes went fishing. Uh, 95 degrees was the high that day. And, uh, we talked about the record that he broke the Owen Smith, 10 and a half pounder from below Wheeler Mm -hmm. Dam in Alabama. Let's talk a little about David Hayes. Now, uh, Mr. Hayes was born, uh, in 1925 in Hodgenville, Kentucky, which is just South of Louisville. Uh, at the time of the catch, 1955, he was 30 years old on their boat that day. He had his wife, Ruth. They had been married since they were teenagers, Terry. Uh, wow. They would ultimately well, it is, court. It is Kentucky. <laughs> uh, also, <laughs> Sorry, everybody from Kentucky. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try not to alienate any of our, our listeners here. By, like by, you've done to Texas? <laughs> by, well, you know, it's, it's, it's good-natured fun with Texas. Okay. But uh, so, so David Hayes' wife, Ruth, was on the boat. Uh, their, their six-year-old son, David, was on the boat. Uh, and they had been coming to Dale Hollow for about three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Hayes had been invited by a neighbor of his in Litchfield, Kentucky, uh, to come out and go fishing with him. And, and that's how he learned how to troll. Uh, Hayes had not been a, a lifelong fisherman. Mm-hmm. Uh, unlike a lot of most of the people who get into the sport, he had not been into it since he was a kid. He got into it a little later in life, but he learned how to troll from a neighbor in the in 1952, and uh, the newspaper accounts coming out after his world record catch in 1955 uh, mentioned that he had only been fishing for a year or so, but it actually had been a little bit longer than that. Right. Yeah, and, and he had claimed to have gotten really, really good at trolling. And I mean, if you learn from a, the right guy and you put enough time on the water, yeah, you can get really good at it. Um, the gear that he was using, the rod, uh, and this is going to see seem completely foreign to everybody out there unless you're 50 years and older. Uh, the rod was a True Temper steel rod. Now, True Temper was a hardware company, but they delved into uh, making fishing gear for, for quite a long time. Um, and so it was probably a five-foot steel rod. Uh, the reel that he had on it was, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think it was even five feet, Terry. I had the privilege okay, yeah. of, of holding that combo in my hand because I knew Mr. Hayes. Yeah. And, and we're going to get in some video that yeah, uh, Nathan so, and I shot with him. But it was a very short rod, maybe maybe four, four and a half feet. Yeah, so True Temper made these really short pistol grip rods back in the day. He had a Pen Pier 209, which is essentially a reel that is used for trolling. Uh, salmon anglers use it. There's also a 109 and a 309 that comes in the series. And all of them have uh, level wind on them. The line that we, he was using was 20-pound monofilament. Uh, the bait was a Bomber 609, which is a 600 series bait that is in the 09 color pattern. Uh, and the rod was in a rod holder when the fish struck. Now, I want to go back to the rod real quick. Steel rods and split bamboo rods in 1950, the early 1950s, were still a thing. Fiberglass had only started reaching the market in the late 40s. So, you know, a lot of people back then probably looked at the light fiberglass as nowhere being near as strong uh, as a steel rod, especially if you're going to be trolling. So do you want to talk about the catch some? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, Because, yeah, we're talking about how unusual the methods and and so forth were. He's trolling. Mm -hmm. He's got this big pen reel. It almost looks like a saltwater reel. Um, He's got a, a steel rod, which is very alien to us today. Well, it gets even more offbeat if you're, if you're looking at it from the 2023 perspective because uh, the family boat that Hayes had was a 21-foot cabin cruiser powered by a 40-horsepower Mercury outboard. There was no trolling motor on this boat. This is not, this is not something that you can work your way down the shoreline uh, <laughs> casting to, to stumps and rocks and things like that. Just about the only thing you can do bass fishing wise in a 21 foot cabin cruiser and do it well would be to troll yep. and, and that's what he did and his, his favorite bait was that 600 series bomber as Terry pointed out the 609 in the, in the 09 color was pearl not, yep. not quite white they did have a white I think that was uh, maybe the straight up 601 or something 
uh, but the 609, he liked two colors. He liked a darker color for walleye, and he liked the pearl, the 609 for the big smallmouths. And, and he was uh, he was not just a, a hell of a smallmouth troller. He was a hell of a walleye troller. And, and there are, if you do a search on newspaper.com uh, and just type David Hayes and walleye, I mean, pictures will come up of him with some big fish. So, anyway. Yeah, I remember Mr. Hayes telling... Uh, Nathan and myself that uh, that he he hooked into some walleye that would have weighed 16, 17, 18 pounds on Dale Hollow and caught him up to 14 or better. So uh, you know, hey, let's. Uh, why are we talking, Terry? Let's let the folks yeah. hear a little bit about uh, uh, David Hayes and that bomber 609 lure. Uh, Mr. Hayes, that's the the bomber model 609, I believe, the the pearl bomber right. that you used to catch the world record smallmouth. Right. And I see that the front trebles, or I guess the rear trebles, on the hook have been ripped out. Yes, sir. And did that, did that happen the in the fight? did it. And one treble was hooked around one gill, one stuck in it, when I got him in the boat. So I guess you might say it's a miracle I got the fish. Uh, this this plug I put on a brand new that morning, and uh, I caught walleye on a different color, and I put this one on when I started trolling, trying to catch the bass, and you can still see the marks on it, what he did to it, they're scratched all over, so... He thought he liked it, but I'm sure he decided he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you, uh, after the treble hook was ripped out, did you ever replace it and fish with that lure again? How's that? Did, did you ever fish with that lure again, or did you retire it after no, that? No, I retired this one. He, he stays with the fish. <laughs> he stays with the fish. What a piece of bass fishing history right there, that bomber model 609. Yeah. I, I don't know whether... Now they started making plastic. This was a wood. And uh, I don't know whether they still make this model or not. Do you know? I don't believe they do, but I'm not certain. Uh, I don't know what the fish thought it was. Crawdad, I guess. Went backwards. And uh, I see you've got a couple of swivels on there, or at least one big uh, snap swivel on there. Is that the way you were fishing it that day? Yeah, you know, this came on the plug. Mm -hmm. This is uh, what I had on there. Pretty good, made pretty good. <laughs> so fishing was slow. Hayes had, had caught a walleye. His wife and son were asleep in the cabin. Uh, and that is when he motored into one of his favorite areas. It was a cut between Illwill Creek and Phillips Bottom, just north of Trooper Island and and absolutely without question in Kentucky waters. Uh, I'm going to show a map here of uh, where that is because Terry when I met Mr. Hayes one of the things I had him do was to put a nice X on a map that I had as now, to where he caught that fish. Now you did the same thing here with Billy Westmoreland and we talked about this in the Billy Westmoreland no, no, no. story. <laughs> did you go to all of his friends? And <laughs> I, <laughs> no. Did you? <laughs> I, I didn't do it with Westmoreland, but I did do it with Hayes. I also, uh, I also, at, when I was at uh, Cedar Hill Resort, I bought an Afghan, you know, uh, like a, a, a blanket type thing, uh, like a map of Dale Hollow, and I had him put an X where he caught the fish, and I had him sign the Afghan, and I'm going to try to track it down. It is somewhere in the house, uh, but I'm not exactly sure where, and Terry's visited the house and seen my office, so he knows why, he knows exactly yeah. why I don't know where anything is. It's, it's like a Jenga puzzle. <laughs> it's, it's bad. But anyway, this anyway. area had, had earned a, a reputation with David Hayes for producing big fish because he had hooked a, a giant bass in this area before. And, and he thinks it might have been the same fish that he later set the record with. And a friend of his had hooked a big fish there as well. And here is a clip from that interview that Nathan and I did in 2009 at uh, Mr. Hayes' home in Litchfield, Kentucky. Uh, I had 
I think I had hooked this fish before. Of course, there's no way of knowing. And I think that my fishing buddy had hooked him once. And we knew where he lived. We even named him Old Joe. Old Joe? So Hayes generally trolled with about 100 yards of line out. Uh, that line, again, was 20-pound test uh, that, he, that he would drag behind the boat with that 609 bomber. Uh, and that would get the bomber bumping in around 25 to 30 foot of water. And here's the story of his catch in his own words. We're in the home of Mr. and Mrs. David L. Hayes in Litchfield, Kentucky. And uh, Mr. Hayes, of course, caught the world record smallmouth bass back on July 9, 1955. Mr. Hayes, that was just about 55 years ago now. And uh, could you take us back and, and tell us about how you caught the world record smallmouth? Well, uh, wife, my wife and son, who was nine, went with me that morning to Dale Hollow. We went down early. And uh, we were going to troll try to catch some big fish. And uh, they went to sleep on me in the cabin. <laughs> uh, I started trolling, picked up a walleye, small one, three, four pounder. And I got the wife to hold the rod while I netted it. But she raised it up out of the water and it flipped off. So she went back to the cabin and went to sleep. And I kept trolling. We had gone down there together previous to this time to try to catch him in that one spot. And there was an old couple that was putting their bait out in the cove we had to swing in. And then they rolled back over and sat on the chairs on the bank. So we couldn't get in there just exactly like we wanted to. But this time they weren't there. So after making several passes at the spot, I thought I hung up, and uh, a trolling rod, I grabbed a hold of it, I had it in a holder, and I felt something on the end of it. And I tightened up my drag a little bit, because he was taking it off, and uh, out of the water he came about three or four feet in the air, shaking his head. But he didn't get rid of the plug. Down he went, and he stayed down. And uh, I, of course, slowing, slowed the boat down. Well, I had 300 foot of line out, and I uh, was afraid to stop. So I pulled him in a slow circle, keeping put too much pressure on him. He's fighting so hard. And uh, he uh, started giving up. It, my big motor was too much for him. And I kept reeling him in. And he came up about a Oh, I'd say 50 foot behind the boat, floating on top of the water. He was tired. But you know what smallmouth do. You think they give up, but they're not ready to <laughs> be killed. So all this time I was thinking about how I'm going to get this fish in the boat. So Hayes caught the record bass between 10 and 10.30 that morning. And he said it took him quite a while to get that fish to the boat. Uh, at one point he told me he thought it might have taken him as much as 
30 minutes. And you don't think that that <laughs> would be even possible, but you got to remember with 20 pound line. Yeah, he was trolling with with 100 yards of fishing line behind him. And when you're trolling, especially with that length of line, which already has a lot of stretch in it, um, and you're also, you don't just throw the, the motor in neutral or reverse to get you closer to the fish. You have to keep that boat in gear and moving forward. Otherwise, you're going to have a slack. tremendous amount of slack yeah. coming the line. So he said it, it might have taken him as much as 30 minutes to bring that fish in. Uh, but anyway, fought the fish for a long time and put it in the cooler. Uh, the cooler was not adequate to the task, but he kept fishing for a while. And around noon, he realized they were getting low on gas. So they went to the closest marina, which was Wisdom Dock. And, and here's what happened there in Mr. Hayes' own words. We fished, oh, another hour or two, I guess. And we went in and uh, we stopped at Wisdom Dock, get some gas, and they weighed the fish. And everybody said, well, what a fish. So after stopping at Wisdom Dock and talking with Granville Lightning Madison, who filled the cruiser with gas, they weighed the big smallmouth, and it was allegedly witnessed by a Kentucky water police officer named Oral Bertram, and the fish weighed in at 11 pounds, 15 ounces. Um, at that point, Hayes decided to call it a day. He returned to Cedar Hill Dock, uh, where the family was staying, and here are his words from then. So I went down to, back down to Cedar Hill, Salina, and I was putting the boat up and I handed it to, they called him Red, he was on the dock. Did you catch anything, Mr. Hayes? I said, yeah, I got a pretty good smallmouth. <laughs> so he saw it and he run for the office. And when I came in, I put the boat up and tied it. The fish was laying on the scales. And lots of activity going on. In fact, my son, who was nine years old, said, I never, what, what's the matter with people, Dad? <laughs> He's excited over a fish. <laughs> so that's basically it. We fished this area, Dale Hollow, quite a bit. You can now sit in the dining room of the state park and look at the water where we fished. As you can imagine, absolute mayhem at the dock. The dock hand grabs that fish and hustles it into the scales. He's, he's trying to get the attention of the dock owner, a gentleman by the name of Dick Roberts. The Roberts family owns Cedar Hill Resort. Lots of excitement. Uh, Hayes doesn't know what the record is, but, but Dick Roberts does because mm -hmm. Dale Hollow had produced fish upwards of nine and a half pounds previous yeah. to the Hayes catch. Um, and once again, the fish gets weighed, and it weighs... 11 pounds, 15 ounces. And here we have Mr. Hayes telling us about the weighing of the, the fish at those two docks, Wisdom Dock and then also at uh, Cedar Hill. Mr. Hayes, when you first took the fish to Wisdom Dock and had it weighed, did it weigh 11 pounds, 15 ounces there? Mm -hmm. And it weighed 11 pounds, 15 ounces again when you yeah. got to uh, Cedar Hill? Yeah. I'm sure he got sick and threw up a few things before he got to the boat. But that Without don't doubt. count. Most of them do. They get excited. So the next day, Dr. Mormon G. Benson of the Tennessee Game and Fish Commission officially identified the fish as a smallmouth. It measured 27 inches long with a girth of 21 and two thirds of an inch uh, in length. And uh, I actually figured out what, what the weight should have been. Um, let, me, let me pull it up here real quick. Uh, so the Big Bass Podcast weight estimation formula is not uh, the formula that we want to use on this fish because it was under 14 pounds. 
So I went ahead and I used the IGFA 927 model, and that model predicts that this fish would have weighed 13.68 pounds. And then I used another model that I've developed that I call the 958 model for smaller fish, and that model puts it in at 13.23 or 13 and a quarter pounds. So it was a big fish. Um, you know, these models are predicting it weighed a little bit more than a pound more than uh, what their skills showed. But those measurements, uh, those are a, that's a big smallmouth, huge smallmouth. Uh, the fish was kept in a freezer at Cedar Hill Dock. Uh, Dick Roberts, the owner, took care of the field and stream fishing contest paperwork. Uh, and a couple of months, months later, uh, Hayes was advised by Field and Stream that he had the world record for the smallmouth bass. And that's the basic story of the catch, folks. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's, it's unusual because, you know, you don't think of uh, world record bass being caught from cabin cruisers while trolling. <laughs> uh, but, but a lot of people fished out of cabin cruisers back then, you know? Yeah, there were no I mean, bass it, boats. If you were fishing no. from, uh, if you were out and consider yourself a dedicated bass fisherman in the day, you probably either had some sort of wooden uh, rowboat with maybe a, a, a very small outboard on there. Mm -hmm. You were probably sculling. Electric yep. trolling motors were out. They had been out for 50 years by then almost, but very few people had them. Uh, guys were sculling with paddles at that point. There were a lot of guys with what they would call car topper boats. Yep. Uh, and, and, and so what Hayes was fishing out of was, was way beyond state-of-the-art, but not something that you'd want to do your conventional bass fishing out of today. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say a couple other things about the, the catch um, that I learned subsequently. Uh, in, in talking with the folks from the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency uh, 50 years after the catch, uh, I learned that uh, they, they had a strong reason to believe that perhaps Mr. and Mrs. Hayes had been drinking a little bit uh, out on the water. And, uh, <laughs> and so maybe they had, they had had a, a little help in, in uh, keeping their day going there. Uh, and of course, no harm in that. Um, and, and Mr. Hayes, you know, one of the things we want to note that when he went to Wisdom Dock shortly after catching the fish and realizing that they were low on gas, he didn't take the fish to the scales he let the, the dock hand take the fish to the scales and the dock hand came back and told him 11 pounds, 15 ounces. And Mr. Hayes realized that that was the biggest smallmouth bass he had ever seen, but he didn't know what the world record was. He had no idea. Mm -hmm. And of course we know now that it was 10 pounds, eight ounces, but, but David Hayes didn't know. And then he takes the fish on to Cedar Hill where he and his family are staying in, in one of the cabins. And again, it's 11 pounds, 15 ounces. And again, David Hayes didn't weigh it. The dock hand took it in to have it weighed. Mm -hmm. So David Hayes never saw this fish hit the scales. Never saw this fish hit the scales. And that's pretty unusual, but, but maybe, that's, maybe that's part of of him having a few beers and taking it easy on the water. It was a hot day. You got to cool down somehow, am I right? Got to hi stay hydrated, right? Got to stay, stay hydrated. hydrated. Staying hydrated so may be more important than staying sober if you're chasing record smallmouths <laughs> in the 1950s. Not more important today, but in the 1950s, who knows? So I have a, a question, uh, and I don't expect an answer. Um, you know, these gentlemen that he learned how to troll from, I mean, you're talking 1950. You, you, this is the Buck Perry the beginning ah. of the Buck Perry era. I wonder if these guys that taught him how to troll learned from Perry because Perry was going all over the United States promoting his spoon plugging technique uh, and theory. Um, it's just something that, you know, I've thought about for quite a while and want to throw it out there right now. That's a great question. Um, I'll tell you why I don't think, I don't think Perry was on Dale Hollow. And here's why I don't think he was on Dale Hollow. At that point, Dale Hollow was, was 12 years old and still experiencing that, that New Lake boom. Uh, not just the New Lake boom in terms of numbers generally, but 
but a boom in terms of big fish because a few years earlier, nine and a half had come out of Dale Hollow. And what Perry liked to do, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe what Perry loved to do was to go to places like, um, like municipal lakes and lakes near large population centers. Chicago. That, yeah, Milwaukee. Chicago. Yeah. Where, where everybody said, oh, the lakes fished out. Fished out, yep. And then Perry would go out there and just destroy the fish. Just go out there and, and whack them with his, uh, uh, you know. With his but I know, but I know he fished Percy Priest. I know he fished Pickwick and Wilson. I mean, I, you know, I've I've read books of his and you know have talked to Bill Dance told me that he saw him at Percy Priest one time. That's interesting. So, and Percy Priest is thirty minutes away from Bull Shoals, so. Yeah, and for folks who are not familiar with Buck Perry, Elwood Buck Perry was a guy from a little town in North Carolina who, as Hickory. a very young man, Hickory, North Carolina, thank you, as a very young man famously said to his father when they were out fishing on a slow day, he said, you know, for every bass in front of us, and they're fishing the bank like everybody did and most people still do today, he said, you know, for every fish in front of us, he said, there's, there's 90% of the fish are behind us. And his dad told told him to shut up, <laughs> and he didn't know what he was talking about. So he spent the rest of his life proving his dad wrong. <laughs> spent the rest of his life finding a way to target those fish, and he came up with a, a very, uh, very important formula that people like the the Lindner brothers and others have have mm -hmm. taken steps further. And that is that if you if you can find the right depth and you can fish your baits at the right speed, you will catch fish. Yep. And it's just that, that Perry pointed out that that there were so many fish behind you and you're not appealing to them because you're not fishing in the techniques, you're not fishing at the speeds, you're not fishing at the depths that those fish are holding. So he, he developed the speed trolling technique with his spoon yep. plugs, which were thin stamped metal lures that would wobble. And uh, very much like a, a bomber 609 maybe, but absolutely, uh, if these guys were disciples of Buck Perry, and there were many, at that time, if they were disciples of Buck Perry, I tend to believe they'd have been using spoon plugs rather uh, than bombers. It's it's hard to say. I mean, and, and, and the, the bomber had only been out for eight years at that point, too, in 1955. I mean, bomber, well, bomber, I think the first patent's 1946, but it really didn't get rocking and roll until 47, you know, 48. So, and you know, you look at that bomber and you see that, that lip coming off at that straight angle the just coming straight off the body of the bait you think oh that must be a really deep diving lure well because you were really restricted in how far you could throw that bait it wasn't particularly aerodynamic the the rods the reels the lines of the day were not geared to making these 50 yard casts and 60 yard casts a 30 yard cast today. back then was good oh it was it was it was monumental. You know, there might be a newspaper story written about, about you if you could make a 30-yard cast with that bait. Well, wait. We'll, uh, we'll wait for Bill, Bill Sonnet to, to say something in the comments. And, and, be kind, oh, no. Bill. Be kind. <laughs> yeah, but, exactly. But, well, now, yeah. The, the guys who were in the casting competitions then who were using casting-type weights and, and casting plug-type weights, they could easily throw it 100 yards. But but the guys who were using conventional bass plugs were not throwing that far. So and 20. A 600-series bomber... On 20 pound test line with a conventional rod and reel today, like that true, ter true temper steel rod, and even a, a better bait casting reel for casting. Oh, because the 209 get, sucks. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't be able to throw it on the 209. But no. if, if you'd have had something better, if you'd have had a, a, a Shakespeare or something, then you could throw it on. You might have been able to get seven feet depth out of that bait on, a, on your best cast, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, but it, it if you look at the ball. Conducive if to you that. If you read the old bomber catalogs, I have actually have a 53 bomber catalog. Um, if you read that, I mean, it specifically says that that 600 series was developed. Its, its biggest deal is on trolling. And it yeah. will get into that 25 to even 40 foot depth range, they claimed, with 600 yards well, of line out. But who trolls? Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, a half you, a mile you, of line out. <laughs> you, you put enough line on one of these things, of course you're going to get it. You can get it to the Earth's core. Uh, and you go the right speed, but, but yeah, to get to 25 or 30 feet, uh, out of that bait, uh, with a hundred yards of line out and going maybe two miles per hour or something like that, a mile and a half, two miles per hour, something like that. Yeah. You could get that thing bumping bottom <laughs> in 25 feet. Um, Easy. and, 
and you know one of the things that uh, uh, Mr. Hayes got into there about having that that fish having ripped one of the hooks out of that bait. Uh, I got to Terry. It was so cool. I got to hold the rod and reel that caught the world record smallmouth bass. I got to hold the bait that caught the world record smallmouth bass. And, and the hook was bent, right? Uh, well, the hook was one hook was gone. Oh, the one hook. Okay, that was yeah. That's what it was. It was gone. One hook was completely. gone. And the other was uh, like wrapped around a gill or something, and that's the only thing that managed to get that fish to the boat. Um, just an epic fight. And, and uh, as Mr. Hayes told me in conversation, he said that fish, he got that fish in the net, he said, and then a whole new battle came up because that fish just went crazy in the net, and he felt yeah. lucky to get it in the boat. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think I recorded, I don't think we got that on tape, but... Uh, you know, it was, um, I wrote a story about the Hayes fish that ran in Bassmaster in, I believe, the October 2005 issue of Bassmaster magazine. And uh, we're going to get into all that in episode three, actually. Uh, but then, uh, after the aftermath of the article, which was called The Case for David Hayes, if you want to look it up, if you've got your archive of Bassmaster magazines handy, folks, um, then Nathan and I went up to Dale Hollow to do some wintertime fishing, and that's when we hooked up and, and had a chance to meet David Hayes again and to record this interview with him because we did not want to let this history get away. Uh, Mr. Hayes was already 80 years old yeah. at that point, and he lived to be uh, 95 years old, I think, when yeah. he passed away in 2020. His wife uh, died in 2012. They have been married almost 70 years. Damn. Wow. Uh, and and, and <clears throat> this is, uh, let me find it so I can get it exactly right here. He had a, a plaque. Um, during, during the course of the time I knew Mr. Hayes, I got to meet with him in, in his home a couple, three times. And he lived in a couple of different homes during that stretch. And each time he kept a plaque outside the front door of his house. And the plaque said, one old fisherman lives here with the catch of his life. Now, whether that was his wife, Ruth, <laughs> yeah, or that was a smallmouth yeah. bass, he was kind of cagey debated. about. Yeah. <laughs> he was kind of cagey about that. But, uh, um, but, but I always loved that plaque. And, um, Do you and own it? A, sadly, no. Sadly, no. <laughs> that surprises um, me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, we're going to get into the, all this, but, but suffice it to say, um, this episode of the Hayes story is kind of the most straightforward, the smoothest, the easiest ride, because we want everybody uh, watching and listening to have a, a clear understanding of how the actual catch of the fish went down, what the circumstances of the catch were, and so forth. Because in episode two, everything is going to go to hell for David Hayes and his record catch. Everything is gonna go straight to hell. And it's gonna take a long time for that to happen. But 40 years after the catch, it all goes bad. And that to me is when the Hayes record truly becomes uh, legendary and the stuff that, that makes it worthy of, of three episodes here, maybe more. Maybe we should do a, a twenty episode series just on the Hayes fish, but we 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 don't want to no. test your patience, so we're gonna yeah, go with three. We, we just broke a thousand. We don't want to go back down to two hundred. Yeah, we, so. we just got a thousand YouTube subscribers, so we're very grateful for that. Thank um, you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Th well, thank all you thousand and sixty or so people who have subscribed. Now, the rest of you, what are you waiting yeah. on? Uh, but but Hayes's Hayes's record is going to be good for forty years, and then. All hell is going to break loose. That's going to be uh, the meat of the next part of the story. This all plays out like some sort of... Uh, the Iliad. Yeah, it's, it plays it's out like a, like a real play here. You know, you've got the catch, and then we're going to talk to you about what happens in the status of that record beginning in 1995, 96. And then we're going to bring you up to about 2005. And then, and then Terry Battisti, we're going to bring into 2023... When uh, when the Big Bass podcast is going to drop one more bomb 
in the uh, in the case of David Hayes and his world record smallmouth bass. <laughs> oh my God! All right, all right, Doctor Bertisi. This has been this has been the shortest of the three, but we need you guys to stick around with us. We wanted to lay the groundwork here. Next yep. episode, we're going to talk about what happens in the nineteen nineties. <laughs> And uh, please don't miss that one. We promise that one will be good. Yep. And uh, but for now, Doctor, you want to slam the door on this and wrap yeah, it up? Yeah, it's like you said. It's uh, it's time to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. Uh, but before you go, please remember to subscribe, like, share, give us a comment, or we'd love talking to you guys on the comment section. It's a small bass, but it, it really helps us out a lot. Uh, don't forget to check out the website uh, at thebigbasspodcast.com. There you'll find the big bass uh, calculator uh, and, and listings of record bass plus, you know, other supplementary material. It's a work in progress, uh, uh, it, but, you know, in time it will become a place that you will hopefully go to a lot. Um, if you want to contact uh, either Ken or myself or Nathan, you can get a hold of us at Ken at the big bass podcast dot com, Terry at the big bass podcast dot com and Nathan at the big bass podcast dot com. I'm Terry Battisti, and on behalf of my partners, Ken Duke and Nathan Benson, thanks for joining us. Be sure to check back next week. Uh, we'll have a, a new show about the same fish with a story <laughs> that you will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember, else. size matters. <laughs>